Hello everybody and welcome to the Safety First Podcast and today's episode we are going to talk about construction safety. Our guest will be Mr. Ravi Shankar, Auditor Manager at LRQA based in Dubai. Hello everybody and welcome to the 10th episode of the Safety First Podcast. Yes, you heard it right. It's the 10th episode that we're doing this together. And today, we are going to delve into a very important topic. And I'm pretty sure it's a very interesting topic to most of you listeners out there. And this is about construction safety. Um, and not forgetting our co-host um, for the Safety First podcast. Hi, Kajo. Hello. Hi, Amanda. And to help us gain a better insight of what construction safety is, we have invited our special guest today, who is Mr. Ravi Shankar, the Auditor Manager at LRQA, who is currently based in Dubai. So he'll be able to give us a good take about what happens in Asia and what happens in Middle East and we can compare what happens in these two regions as well. Hi, Mr. Ravi. Hello. Uh, yeah. yeah, just to give a quick introduction, uh, maybe Mr. Ravi, a quick introduction of yourself and what you do at LRQA. Okay, so my name is Ravi Shankar and I, I'm working with LRQA as an Auditor Manager for Business Assurance based in uh, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. And I'm also one of the senior third-party certification auditors for quality, health, safety, and environment management system. Those who are hearing maybe our company LRQA for the first time, we are one of the certifying body uh, whose offices are based in UK. And I am with LRQA for almost 25 years. And uh, I have been doing construction safety audits for last 15 years. I'm quite passionate about uh, providing value to our customers with our auditing expertise, which I'm sure is useful for all interested parties and not only to our clients. So thank you very much for giving this opportunity to express my views on construction safety, which is the topic for podcast. I'm quite honored and humbled. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abhi. It's really an honor to have you uh, join us today. So I just want to ask you, why do you think that health and safety is significant in our daily lives and specifically why does construction safety hold importance in the current Middle East and Asia context? So we have to understand that as society we have the moral and legal and ethical responsibility to safeguard not only our health and safety but also people who are working around us and even public you know who, who, whose health and safety we can influence. So we all understand that general taruma on health and safety, accidents leading to injuries and fatalities. The affected person's life can change forever in case of any short-term or long-term permanent disabilities. Needless to say, cost on companies and other interested parties in general and its economic impact on society due to the cost of medical treatment and insurance will be quite high and the hidden costs like taruma and hardship uh, which workers' family has to face. So whichever part of geography we are, we must ensure that workers return safe after the work. And the safety measures, measures also boost productivity, enhance employee morale, and reduce the economic burden caused by accidents and health issues. It also supports the UN Sustainability Goal number 3, which is good health and well-being. To answer the second part of the question that why construction safety is important in the Middle East and Asia, uh, the topic of the podcast, is that construction is a very high-risk activity in general. That's what we have to understand. Due to the complex nature of projects sometimes involving heavy machinery, equipment, working at heights, and various hazardous materials, what we have to come across. And in our region, the Middle East and Asia, the rapid urbanization and infrastructure development have led to increased construction activities. Uh, in fact, some, some places you can call it a construction boom. And due to dependence upon the large migrant workforce uh, in many countries, it has its own issues to be handled, like potential for any health and safety incidents will be much higher because of the lower skills, uh, the education, not so good working conditions and infrastructure, especially if it's the construction is in unorganized sectors being conducted on an ad hoc basis. Limited resources for small companies. We understand that bigger companies, larger companies can employ a lot of resources to manage the safety. But same may not be true for the small companies or companies in the unorganized sectors. So that's why ensuring construction safety in these regions is very critical to prevent accidents 
protect workers' rights and uphold public safety. You mentioned about um, heavy machineries and working at heights. I believe those are the higher risks that we face at Middle East and Asia. We know that all of these are contributing to the accident statistics in the region. So what's the go-to um, resource that we can get these uh, health and safety statistics in the region for all the safety professionals that are listening out here? I'm pretty sure they are interested to know where to find these and what are the top injuries and ill health at work. Uh, good question. I would say that health and safety statistics in the Middle East and Asia, they can be obtained from governmental agencies, industry associations, and also the research organizations. Uh, they often pub publish reports, you know, on time to time basis, like, like the newsletters, magazines related to the construction industry on the workplace injury, illness, and fatalities. I would say that uh, International Labor Organization, ILO, which I'll be making a reference uh, multiple times in this podcast, and the World Health Organization's WHO, they provide valuable global statistics and trends. And these sources can shed light on prevalent injuries and health issues. However, I would also say that uh, there is no exclusive data for Middle East and Asia. So if we... Go to the ILO website, we can find the health and safety statistics uh, for the various companies. But you, you might also come across that uh, maybe some countries are missing there. Uh, so the statistics at times could be open for interpretations. I would say that, for example, you see a high incidence and accident rate in the developed countries. As compared to a developing nation, that may not say that safety is poor in this country, but the higher numbers could be due to the good reporting system, the mechanism as compared to a developing nation with poor safety culture. So to to summarize here, I would say that uh, at this stage, the we need to go back to the the government websites uh, on health and safety, and ILO, WHO can be a good source. But again, the mechanism is is left to the individual nations, countries. You know that to what extent they they report, and maybe I think that is something. Uh, th those who are listening to this podcast, you know, the people who are in governance, uh, they can pay a little bit more attention on these aspects. Thing that I, I did find while I was preparing for this podcast that in in certain developed countries, you know, there is a very good mechanism for reporting and any major accidents and incidents which happens uh, of public interest. You also have the proper investigations done and the report published on their website. So it also serves as a lessons for other companies, you know. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I think you raised a point then very well um, said point to say that accidents are reported so that we can learn from it. It's not because we want to shame anybody, but it's because we want to learn from it to prevent it from happening again. I think I learned a lot about that uh, being a journalist myself and how credibility is seen in many different parts of the world. Uh, th so thank you for sharing that. So we can see that there are a lot of challenges faced in the construction industry itself. So what do you think are the key health and safety challenges the construction industry face, especially in the Middle East and Asia? Right. So in the construction industry in particular, to be honest, actually, I started my career from construction industry, you know when I passed out from my college. That was the first job I did. And then somehow in my different roles, whether it is as a construction engineer, project engineer, and now as a business assurance auditors, I have been associated with construction industry quite a lot. So the current challenges, I would say the key challenges uh, would be that inadequate, inadequate training and awareness, lack of effective safety management systems, many places, Language barriers for a diverse workforce, especially if we are employing a lot of expert workforce. And inadequate, so law might be there, but inadequate enforcement of safety regulations. And the most important, the pressure to meet tight projects. So we might have all the mechanism in place, but suddenly you hear that, okay, we need to complete this project, which is already delayed in a, in a cert certain period of time. So that, that puts a lot of pressure and uh, it, it increases the risk actually in terms of health and safety. And also the cultural factors, people from diverse background and the subcontracting which is happening now more often than what we have done in the past. Uh, so these are some of the challenges and uh, not in the order of priority. On the technical side, I would say that fall from height remains one of the top risk in construction industry. 
and this is followed by risk of injury due to excavation, trenching, struck by moving vehicles and objects, uh, heavy equipments, machineries, lifting, electrical shocks, electrocution is another area, you know, major areas in, uh, of, of, of uh, construction risk, slip trips and falls, poor housekeeping, and also the health risk which, uh, which we have from the high heat and humidity in certain part, especially in the Gulf countries, and also exposure to the dust and fumes at construction site. So these are some of the top risks and challenges. Um, I, I highlighted here in caps, time constraint, cost accident. Um, and I think it's a worldwide problem when it comes to construction, closing the deadline. Everybody will rush for their work. You mentioned about fall from height, excavation activities, um, and also poor housekeeping. When it comes to housekeeping, um, it, it's quite drastic to see the difference between Singapore and Malaysia. Though we cannot expect the construction site to be as clean, that's for sure, right? Nobody expects it to be sparkling Most of the time, every time. A site is of a temporary nature. So you, you cannot have all the amenities and infrastructure in place. Yes, exactly. But at the same time, we also see, even though there are a little bit of mess here and there, but there are also ways to make it very systematic to make sure that everything that you want to get can can get it at the same place. Those safety hazards that you mentioned just now are very well known um, in, in our region. But in your experience, right, I believe you have been doing auditing the whole time and you have seen many things that they missed. Right. So what are the few like lesser known, but you feel that it's very important for them to conform to, um, especially in construction companies? So uh, basically some lesser known safety risks and hazards will include like uh, ergonomic issues coming from repetitive motions, awkward postures, which uh, many of us, we don't pay proper attention. For example, a guy who is carrying some load some concrete mist in a, in, a, in a particular position or doing some plastering work. So that person is repeatedly subjected to a particular posture and, and, and this could be really an issue to have, uh, you know, maybe muscular, musculatular disorders, you know, coming up later on. Exposure to harmful chemicals or materials. And nowadays, I think this corona, post-corona, the psychological stress, which uh, also comes, you know, uh, after the pandemic, uh, working long hours, construction sites uh, it will be normally, you know, long hours work there, sometimes working in the confined spaces. And uh, the surge of sand storms, uh, especially certain part of the Gulf, I would say, in the summertime. Uh, the cases of workers' suicide is also making newsletters now, uh, especially the post-pandemic. I think it is to do with the mental well-being of the workers, and especially if they are working away from the home and... Uh, and the lack of proper counseling or policies from the companies. And uh, sometimes that to acknowledge also lack of acknowledgement that, okay, it's it's a problem, you know, because suicide might be seen something like a very, very private thing that, okay, this is what worker did, why, why we are being held responsible, you know, so people need to look into that. Human behavior is catching up more attention. And uh, just a few days before, I was talking to a construction professional and uh, that person was telling that poor coordination at times on projects also is a, is a lesser known hazard now. That, you know, we have everything in place, but uh, there was lack of coordination in bet between different agencies and, uh, and this led to the problem. Yeah, definitely. And, and about mental health, I totally agree with you as well. Uh, because I think in WSH Asia, in the previous episode, we also had a clinical psychologist to talk about mental health at the workplace. And, and it's quite interesting to see how important it has become for the construction industry as well. So we are very happy to see that there are more awareness out there. Uh, but at the same time, whether these are put into actions, we are looking at probably having more of these campaigns to go out and hopefully reaching the correct target audience. So yeah, what you pointed out is definitely the safety risk that we should know and we should be more vigilant about. Yeah, Mr. Ravi, I just have one question for you. Like uh, earlier you mentioned about mental well-being and all those psychological factors. Um, are they being taken seriously in Middle East, in your opinion? Yes, yes, it, it is being taken up and a lot of companies, you know, they are doing work on that one and they have the well-being program, 
employee assistance program and as i said you know sessions what what they do themselves to very good toolbox talk to improve the awareness but uh, but same cannot be said for smaller companies unorganized sectors there i see see a problem you know i think more work needs to be done wow okay thank you for sharing because sometimes we don't know what's happening on the other part so it's nice to know from you um and we hope that you know more people take this very seriously like not only in asia not only in middle east but throughout the globe as well yes yes it's 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 throughout yeah it's it's the globe actually not only middle east and asia yeah i have another question for you because now everything is technological so in your opinion is there a sufficient technological advancement in the construction industry to keep pace with the other sectors like logistics and manufacturing yeah i would say yes and no both actually because you know, what we have to remember that uh, the construction uh, you know is works is being done very traditionally even now we don't have uh, robots uh, replacing workers you know for hazardous operations as it is happening in uh, other industry for example uh, in inspection side you know like inspection in a confined space now people are using drones uh, you know for for doing the inspection but same th- doesn't happen in construction very traditional you have to excavate the earth and then do the trenching do the foundation work do the brick work and plastering and cladding and all those things some development has taken place for example building information modeling drone surveillance and then wearable technology so for example by looking into the face and if you have got a proper app you can find out whether the worker is stressed uh, there are safety management software but if i compare it to the sectors like logistics manufacturing i think there is a lot of room for growth i think more more research work needs to be done in in this area and uh, i'm sure that once we have good technological advances in construction it can enhance safety streamline the process and also improve the overall project efficiency uh, so according to me i would say that uh, more work needs to be done in this area and people who are very the tech savvy i think they need to spend more time there okay um mr davi with your experience in auditing in the construction industry what do you think that can be done uh, today to improve the health and safety in the industry each one has to play their role in ensuring workers are safe for example countries nations they need to set up very strong and robust governance mechanisms including required act and regulation to protect workers fulfill their obligations towards ILO in terms of providing required inspection and governance reporting analysis of incidents and also leading campaign on health and safety at company level you know follow the relevant rules and regulations and uh, fulfill your obligations and uh, do not limit to the minimum requirements i would say that i split the answer also into two parts one is the technical aspects in the construction industry which is the high risk which i mentioned let's say working at height we need to have proper fall arrest system training on usage of the harness the scaffolding by competent personnel if it's an excavation and trenching then proper compaction of the ground to prevent collapse of earth and then also at construction site one of the biggest risks is also hit by moving machinery or objects so the people need to be competent proper traffic management system warning signs provision of the banksmen regular inspection of machinery and equipments so again ensuring that the work is done by competent people proper earthing of the equipment and also using the rcds on temporary sites where proper earthing system might not be available protecting from the high heat and humidity we all know that high heat humidity can cause stress it can cause fatigue heat exhaustion and sometimes it can lead to fatality also also the cover arms to suit the climate for example companies might be having a policy to have a full sleeve but when there is lot of heat humidity then uh, do we really need a full sleeve that we need to question ourselves proper personal protective equipment i would say the last line of defense uh, but that has to be very very strong many companies uh, which i audited i found that uh, they do provide hard hats helmets eye goggles but that may not be of the proper standard it can be maybe uh, some sometimes a cosmetic thing and then coming to the management aspects so treating workers in the same way as far as health and safety is concerned that's very very important 
no discrimination policy and this might require proper hr policy to be in place and then top management involvement on day to day safety matters i have seen many companies they start their meetings with safety movements i think that's a very good initiative touring the workplace for time to time and removing any fears of punishment and reprisals if any any lack of safety measures are reported the worker participations can go long away and this is not only the case for middle east and asia we conducted a webinar and we asked people the questions what is the biggest uh, challenge in health and safety and the worker participation the lack of proper worker engagement is scored very high that was the top challenge for any organization or the management there have been several case studies which have demonstrated that good engagement of the workers has improved worker morale improved the productivity and also reduce the absenteeism and health and safety incidents so finally worker and interested parties also you have got a role to play if i am a worker or interested parties visitor then do everything to protect yourselves pay attention to the rules regulation the policy which is set, set up by the establishment be always vigilant and proactive to report problems familiarize yourself with the health health and safety protocols and do not take any shortcuts and put your life in danger i took like a full page of notes from that one session that one session i'm really sorry that i had to give a very very long answer but i hope that it was a little bit useful no it's it really is from my understanding of whatever you've just mentioned about the entirety of things i believe is what we at wsh asia also always shout about we always say safety is everyone's responsibility it's not just one person it's everybody's responsibility and it has to be put as the utmost priority the biggest issue with any industry especially construction industry is that you might have very good measures but uh, suddenly there is a surprise element and a major incident happens you know so that surprise element you know what we can do to prevent that i think that's a, that's a big challenge for any companies big or small absolutely I agree. And in our organization, the Best Age Asia, we deal with many regions. And in Southeast Asia alone, there are like ten countries in here, and everyone speaks very diverse language, have very different safety culture levels. I believe in Middle East, it's the same. So, what are the international laws and standards that can contribute to prevent all this from happening? So, I mentioned about the international level organizers and the ILO. You know, so that was set up way back in nineteen nineteen. and it focused on the labor right and their welfare and then there was a convention which was done in 1981 c155 so that looked into the uh, the intergovernmental participation cooperation on the health and safety matters on the on from the member organizations from my understanding there are 187 member states an example of safety and health convention in construction industry in particular was the c167 uh 1988 so these informations are uh, freely available on the ilo website anybody can make a reference and it gives you an idea that uh, as a as a nation as an organization as an individual what are our uh, obligations and also the treaty was signed by several nations which mandates implementations of ilo conventions uh there is one very good guideline uh the ilo ohs 2001 Uh, uh which is there for quite some time and ilo statistics they do confirm that good regulatory mechanism has gone long way to reduce health and safety incidents coming to the international standards uh, i would say that uh, uh the assessments which i have conducted you know the formal health and safety standards have really led to the reduction in major and minor incidents fatalities first aid cases and improve their health and safety performance training and awareness of course that plays a key role and uh, this this is very integral to in the these standards earlier we had the osas 18001 but now that that we have international standard from iso which is called 45001 occupational health and safety management systems so that provides a very good framework based on the plan do check act so how do we plan our activity like risk assessment operational controls providing necessary amenities infrastructure and then implement all those controls you monitor check during your own reviews uh, site tours audits uh, you know things like that one and then if you find a gap then you try to act on it and uh, continuously look into improving the health and safety performance 
Okay. On that note, Mr. Rabi, we'd like to know more about what LR2A actually do and how can it actually help overcome challenges and improve safety performance in the construction industry? Thank you very much. So that's a bit of marketing exercise for us. So LRQA, as you know, that uh, it's a global organization and providing a certification of management system. Uh, health and safety, of course, is one of them. LRQA was also the first one to get accreditation uh, in the United Kingdom, UK, uh, as far as the, the management certification is concerned. And uh, it, has, it does have multiple accreditations, so, you know, apart from UK, uh, to provide our services. It provides auditing services, training, training for auditing and awareness on health and safety. And uh, we believe that as independent body, you know, you have got an obligation. So we act like an assurance provider, which can provide confidence between the companies and those interested parties relying on certification. For example, if you see a company which is health and safety certified by LRQA, so you expect that, you know, this company truly deserves that. So we act like a trust factor between the organization and people who are relying into the certification. We have got very strong team of uh, health and safety professionals who undergo rigorous uh, internal training, mentoring from very experienced and competent people. So that's also one of the job, you know, for to look after my team and train them on on various aspects of health and safety audits. And uh, we have also acquired an ESG entity and uh, we are providing advisory services because society governance, you know, that is coming more and more. So those who are looking to integrate the sustainability part, the governance part, along with their health and safety, I think it's going to be the win-win situation. That's, I think, a game-changing thing for, for LRQA because for a company, when you give a non-conformity, it also means it's a problem. But the difference is you give them the solution as well. What you mentioned about ESG, I would say it's a very smart move on LRQA's side. The ESG part, yeah. Because, you see, economic and societal cause, governance, they are all linked together. For example, we have a lot of construction activities uh, in many parts of the uh, Asia and the Middle East. And, uh, and uh, the, the construction also induces, you know, the health and safety issues, which comes along with that one. So as, a, as an individual, as a society, we need to have a balance that we need economic prosperity. But at what cost it also comes, uh, what societal impact it has, and on the individual, I think that aspect is very, very, very important to consider. And thank you so much for having the nice word about uh, LRQA. You know, I really appreciate that one. Thank you. So, Mr. Ravi, we'd like to thank LRQA for also sharing very top-notch articles, very informative articles with WSH Asia as well. I think... Uh, in terms of resources, we also learn from there as well. So like you said, when you had the webinar, these are the resources and these are the kind of things that people should look up to and look after when they want to learn something. Do you have any direct messages that you would like to convey to interested parties pertaining to the construction industry? Yeah, I mean, the final concluding question is really something I, you know, I had to think about it because if I start mentioning everything, it will take a lot of time. So I would like to stick to the key points here. So number one, give everyone to give due importance to health and safety. The intergovernmental cooperation, which, uh, which stands at ILO level, can help to come out with common agenda and protect workers from in adverse impact. Then very important is also each one has to play their role in ensuring workers are safe. So whether, uh, you know, I'm from the organizations or I'm, I'm on the governing body side or individual worker or public as well. The role of national governance the, at country level is extremely important because that sets the tone. A lot of good work has been done in the past to improve health and safety at national level, like some countries have established a good labor law, clear policy on working hours, minimum wages, free medical facilities, other acts, policies to protect worker rights. And as an organization, try to build a strong and robust safety culture because that's the safety culture is not built overnight or by doing some few activities. It, it really, you know, it requires a lot of efforts uh, organization-wide, you know, to involve everyone, you know, right from the CEO management at the highest level and down to the lowest level in the, uh, the workers, you know. Uh, so safety culture, try to improve that, adopt the best practice, what is practical for you. 
and even small initiatives can go a long way to improve health and safety performance. Try to go beyond the minimum requirements and set your own benchmark. You know why we should copy, we should be setting our own benchmark. So finally, I would say that always think of human element when it comes to workers and remember our moral and social obligations. So embarrass the safety culture, invest in training and technology, and work together to create safe working environments for everyone involved. And uh, I think efforts of everyone can go a long way to improve the health and safety performance in the construction industry. So that's what uh, will be my concluding remark here and message to everyone. So it is not limited to an individual or a company, but uh, it's a, I would say that effort of uh, all the interested parties uh, related to this industry. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Ravi Shankar. Before we conclude today's episode on construction safety, we'd like to advise you to prioritize your safety. Always wear appropriate personal protective equipment for your task, follow established safety protocols, and stay alert to potential hazards on the construction site. And with that, thank you for tuning in and being a part of the Safety First podcast. Stay safe. This is Kajol and I'm Amanda and we are signing off this time. Thank you.